This week, our incredible stonemasons repaired the stonework around the Chateau Facade's epic coats of arms. We move one step closer to hanging new wallpaper in the first floor ensuite. And the restoration of the Shea roof reaches its third week. Well, we're here high on the scaffolding on the southern side of the chateau. And we thought we'd take the opportunity to describe this incredible sculpted element. It's in a fronton or a pediment, and there's one on the northern side and one on the southern side. So anyone approaching the chateau, no matter from which direction they came, would have seen it. What exactly is it? Well, it's two coats of arms. Here on the left-hand side, the coat of arms of Antoine Charles Achard de la Haye, and next to it, his wife, Madame Benin Modeste de la Motte Barisay. And it symbolizes their marriage in 1767 and the dynastic importance of the coming together of these two grand families. In fact, it was their marriage that enabled the construction of the incredible building that we're restoring today. And so during its restoration, it's worth taking the time to reflect on its different elements and what they mean and symbolize. So let's start at the top. We can see here a crown. It's actually a coronet, which is the symbol of authority of a marquee. In reality, a coronet would have rarely been worn, perhaps once or twice in the Marquis's life during a royal coronation. But on a coat of arms, it told everyone his noble rank. We can see arms on each side, an axe, a halberd, and this symbolized Monsieur Achard de la Haye's status as an officer in the French army. But let's look at the coats of arms themselves. What do we see? Well, on each one we see a rampant lion. That is, a lion standing tall on its two hind legs. And if you can see in each coat of arms, the lion is actually in profile. It's side on. And that was a sign of the virtue of magnanimity. If the lion was looking towards us or the head was looking away, it would have symbolized other virtues. We can see here on Madame de Lamotte Barisay's a coat of arms, the fleur-de-lis. The fleur-de-lis, the lily flower, is the classic symbol of the French monarchy. What that tells us is that this house is asserting its loyalty to the French crown. We can see also these bizarre looking birds or merlets in French. They're beakless and they don't have any legs and their symbolism is somewhat contested. In some cases, they're considered a migratory bird. And as a migratory bird, sometimes they're a symbol of pilgrimage or perhaps participation in the Crusades. And so in a sense, they symbolize religious devotion. And then we can see these strange lines. And these lines, both vertical and horizontal, are very important. Lots of people have asked us if at some stage the coats of arms would have been painted or coloured in some way. And it's a fair question to ask because we know that the incredible sculpted facades of grand churches and cathedrals during the medieval period and during the Renaissance were often painted in quite gaudy colours, which is hard for us to imagine today when we reflect on those quite sombre stone facades. But we know that these coats of arms were never painted. And the reason we know that is because these lines represent the colours that would have been on the coats of arms in their actual state. Those colours in heraldic terms are called tinctures. And these vertical lines represent the colour red or gul in heraldic language. And the horizontal lines represent the colour blue or azure in heraldic terms. And so we can imagine exactly how these coats of arms were supposed to look simply by looking at the clue of the direction of the lines on the coats of arms themselves. Then if we look down further, we come across this cross. It's the cross of St. Louis. 
and the Cross of St. Louis was an order awarded to retired French military officers. It was created by Louis XIV and it was named in honour of the only French king who became a saint, Louis IX. So this again attests to Monsieur Achard de la Haye's status as a retired officer. And so with the scaffolding in place and the restoration of these coats of arms underway, it gives us a unique opportunity to admire them up close in a way they were never originally intended to be seen. Et donc du coup, euh, là actuellement, on est en train d'effectuer les, les, les réparations du, euh, du, euh, du fronton et notamment des faces euh, derrière les sculptures. Donc c'est une étape qui est assez importante euh, pour nous, qui nous demande quand même pas mal de délicatesse euh, dans l'exécution. Notamment parce que du coup, on a, les, on a les blasons qui restent vraiment tels quels et qui vont être restaurés euh, le, plus, le plus finement possible. Donc pour, euh, pour procéder euh, à notre réparation, donc on, va avoir, on, on utilise euh, plusieurs méthodes. Il va y avoir un nettoyage du coup, à la brosse métallique pour vraiment retirer euh, le plus d'aspérité euh, possible, en fait, tout ce qui vient à être amené à, à partir. Et après, on va faire un dépoussiérage. Une fois le dépoussiérage effectué, en fait, on va venir humidifier la pierre de manière à ce que le, le mortier de réparation qu'on utilise en fait, vienne vraiment s'incorporer avec la pierre et tienne dans le temps. Si les réparations ne sont pas suffisantes, on vient à faire des, des greffes. Donc en fait, c'est tout simplement découper un morceau de pierre et insérer un morceau de pierre neuve, assemblé avec, euh, euh, avec, euh, avec l'autre morceau. Et après, on vient effectuer des changements, donc des suppressions complètes de pierre. On va venir complètement les extraire du fronton pour pouvoir venir les, les changer. Donc on va commencer à venir purger vraiment ce qui ne tient pas, donc vraiment ce qui, ce qui menace de tomber. Hein Deuxième étape, on vient vraiment compléter la suppression de la pierre qui ne tient pas. Troisième étape, une des plus importantes, le dépoussiérage. Une fois que du coup qu'on a bien dépoussiéré, on va venir bien humidifier la zone, retirer toutes les petites poussières, en fait toutes les pellicules de poussière que la balayette ne pourrait pas retirer. Donc après on a un on va procéder de cette manière-là. Donc en fait, on a, on, a pré on a préparé au préalable notre mortier de réparation. Hein, donc c'est euh, le mortier de réparation de pierre d'une de, de, euh, marque bien connue qui est, qui est passé euh, en bureau d'études pour pouvoir avoir en fait la validation euh, des DTU, tout simplement. Bon là, je vais faire ça avec la spatule, mais normalement on utilise des truelles de différentes tailles pour pouvoir en fait s'adapter en fait, à l'endroit où on va venir étaler. Donc là, on va, je vais, pour l'exemple, je vais, je vais faire ça sur, sur une surface plane. Et en fait, on vient l'appliquer sur la pierre humidifiée. Et on, va, et on va lui donner sa première forme. Là. Une fois qu'on a mis en place le mortier, on va attendre qu'il vienne à sécher. Donc une fois que c'est bien sec, en fait, on va venir supprimer la matière au fur et à mesure. Ce qui va nous permettre en fait de créer vraiment des arêtes vives. Une fois qu'on va avoir fini pour pouvoir harmoniser avec, avec l'ensemble du château et la façade, en fait, on va effectuer ce qu'on appelle un lait de chaud. Et ça va nous permettre en fait de vraiment harmoniser la, le mortier pierre et la pierre de tuffeau. Et voilà.
Well, progress has been made this week in this beautiful premier etage or first floor ensuite. And this is the ensuite that we've been working on for some time now. So if you haven't followed us or you need to refresh your memory, please look back over our previous videos where we cover the restoration of this beautiful room. We are on the eastern side of the chateau. We're underneath the section of the chateau where the roof has already been restored. So we are watertight and dry here. But here we've put down new hessian backing to make way for our beautiful new wallpapers to be hung. And that was big progress this week. But being realistic also, there's still a long way to go. So once the hessian goes down, we then put down a backing paper to provide a solid backing for the new wallpapers. And we explained in a previous video the reason why this hessian backing is used here at Pernon, but it creates a void between the wall and the wallpaper to allow the wallpaper to breathe and to keep the humidity away from the wallpaper. Why did we put New Hessian up here? Because when we were removing the more recent wallpaper on these two walls, we found traces of the beautiful original 18th century wallpaper. So we've taken down the entire Hessian panel so that we can protect those wallpapers and keep a record of them. On the other side of this room, the original Hessian, the original 18th century wallpaper backing is still in place. And we've just lifted pieces of it up to allow us to get some electrical wiring underneath to bring electricity into this room. We will also give it a good clean behind. You can see that there's a lot of cobwebs and so on in there. So we'll give that a nice clean. But then this wallpaper will be secured again. And when we put down the wallpaper backing on the other Hessian walls, we will also put it on here and this room will be ready for its wallpaper. But there's still a lot of work that we still need to do in this room. This wooden boiserie panel below me here needs to be painted. We need to make some repairs to the boiserie where it had previously been damaged from having another sink attached to it. We need to prepare the floors, wax the floors, and then our plumbers can come in and do the final work for the arrival and evacuation of water. So progress has been made, but we still have a lot to do, but this ensuite is going to be truly spectacular when it's finished. Great progress is being made on the restoration of the Shea roof, the barrel room roof. Uh, and one of the projects that we now have to get on and complete while this roof restoration is underway is the work to clear this loft or this uh, attic that you can see behind me. Now, uh, it, was, it wasn't an original part of the Shea. In fact, the loft has been made with this floor of these sort of hollowed bricks there reasonably modern but unfortunately it was never meant to be walked on and so walking in here is a perilous and somewhat reckless thing to do so in order to clear it we have to walk effectively on the tops of the stone walls which thankfully are reasonably wide around the edge and that gives us enough access to clear it out now what's up here well uh, not a lot of important things as you can imagine if you weren't meant to walk on the roof they'd install a lot of important things up here but there are some things uh, these little hatches or trap doors that we've found, which we'll bring down and rescue, and we'll work through with our architect is exactly what they were and why they're up here. They're probably something to do with the winemaking process. But behind me, and you can see from this video footage, when they've restored the roof in the past, the volige or the battens that the terracotta tiles sat on, as they rotted away, when they came to repair it, they simply dropped them down onto the loft ceiling. And that means there's an enormous amount of rotted wood to be cleared away. And this is gonna take us a few days to clear out. Once we do that, we can remove this loft ceiling 
and open up the beautiful charpente, the beautiful oak beams that make up the roof of the shay so that we'll be able to see them from the ground level when we're in our barrel room. It'll let in a lot more light. We think it'll look really quite charming uh, and it's an important part of um, the, the next steps we need to take to restore this beautiful space. And don't forget, if you'd like to follow the restoration of Pernor more closely, we post a daily update in our Instagram stories. If you'd like to support the restoration project here at Pernor, we post an exclusive weekly video over on Patreon. Otherwise, just hit the subscribe button and we'll keep you updated here.